in chapter one, um, says that he alone is the leader and the source of everything needed in the church, speaking of Christ. God has put everything beneath the authority of Jesus Christ and has given him the highest rank above all others. And now we, this is the verse I want you to listen to, and we, his church, his people, you as an individual, are his body on the earth, walking about, that, that fills, when we are his body and we walk and represent him on the earth, that fills him who is being filled, he's being filled by our walking in his image and representing him. So it's not just that it fills us. The fact is, is, well, we can't do that. We can't walk in his image and be Christ on earth unless we are filled with him. And then he, it says we are filled with him and that our being filled with him fills him. Then the very next verse, go to chapter two because that's already established. It's this in and out of a relationship that he fills me and I fill him. That's an awesome thought of a responsibility that we fill or we are the fullness of Christ. That we do something for him. That we are fulfilling to him. And so then it says in the very next verse, in verse 8, I mean verse 2, or sorry, verse 1, 2, verse chapter 2, verse 1, it says, and his fullness that we have filled him with then in turn fills you. If that's eternity right there. That constant us filling him, him filling us, us filling him. And just what Candace did, you get this, which is the sign for eternity. And so that filling and us filling and him filling us is a constant thing that that is what being human is all about. That's what he created us for. That's what he did in the garden is he created us in the garden, humanity, humans, to be in that relationship of us filling him, him filling us, and that constant spiritual oneness that is our identity. That is who we are to be. Okay, so that's life. That is what life is, is being filled with him, us, us filling him. And then that joy of living, that was his original in intent. And that's what Christ came to die to repair so that we could have that intent given back to us. We could be reintroduced from flesh to spirit. Because you can't be full of God unless your spirit is alive. Your spirit cannot be alive unless you have Christ in you. All right, so he says, this fullness is in you, and his fullness fills you. Even though, and he's going to, this, this whole paragraph is the miracle of what God has done. He says, even though you were once like corpses, I mean, you were walking dead. Dead in your sins and your offenses. Because when they fell in the garden, their spirit died. And so when your spirit's dead and you're walking around in your flesh and your mind is controlling your flesh with no godly input, then you're in darkness. And that darkness is like death. It is death. You're walking dead. It wasn't that long ago that you lived in the worldliness of this world. You lived as God. You lived with the customs of this world. You live with the values of this world. You live with the religion of this world. What is the religion of this world? There's only there's only two religions in this world. I don't know if y'all realize that or not, but there's only two religions in the world. There is the religion of self, or the God of self, or there is the God of reality, the real God. And that's the only two choices you have. Either God is God, or you are God. Because in, in the garden, Eve chose, and Adam chose, instead of to be in the image of God and into relationship with God and into that fullness with God, they chose to be God. And God had to vacate. Because 
humanity and human can only occupy one God at a time. Either your God or God's God. That's the only two choices. Now we can dress our God up in a lot of ways. And we can even as not recognize ourselves, but it all basically goes down into control. God is in control of everything. Always has been, always will be. Doesn't matter if you recognize it. Doesn't matter if you accept it. Doesn't matter if you follow it. God is in control. Without God, there is nothing. Without God, I have no breath. With God, I have no life. I mean, there is nothing without God. Colossians says that Christ literally keeps everything in nature and creation working. He is in everything. He works everything. He does everything. So without God, there is nothing. But Eve and Adam decided to, instead of be in a relationship with God, they choose, chose to step away from God and to be God themselves. That's death. And the punishment of that separation from God is you no longer have the spirit of God or the life of God inside of you. And if you die in that state, it's eternal separation from God. We call that hell. Hell is on earth, too, because people live separated from God. And so they live in hell on earth. They just start their hell early. Because separation from God is and even right now, people in earth around us, all, all humanity is either living in separation from God and they're being God and they're struggling in darkness, or they're in light and, they're, and God is God and they're living in light. It's just two. It's just two. The problem is is that it's very hard to differentiate because God does, God's grace is such that he literally won't leave us in total darkness. And so the conscious and even darkness is that there is light there calling them home. And in us, who have received Christ as Savior, there's still darkness in here, in me, because I still struggle with giving complete control. And so even in this precious relationship that I have, I continually want to be God still. I continually try to be in control still. I continually want to be assured that I know what's going to happen. And trust and faith releases that to say, God knows what's going to happen, and I don't have to. But you're walking around dead when you're in sin and trespass because you're on your own trying to control everything that is not in your control. And he said, it wasn't that long ago that you lived in that state. Unfortunately, when you're in that state, you don't recognize it, but you are, and it says here, obeying the dark ruler of this earthly realm who fills the atmosphere with his authority and works diligently in the hearts of those who are disobedient to the truth of God. That is, Satan, literally, his hope is to build an army big enough of dark followers who, do, who reject the light of God, who will fight against God at the end and try to defeat Christ. The book already tells us that that's not going to happen, that Satan is a defeated foe already. But he doesn't, he doesn't operate that way. He doesn't operate in defeat. He operates in it that he wants to win. And I mean, the world is wicked. You look around you, and man, is, man has lost even his, uh, his appreciation for fellow man. I mean, you have somebody here in your own church, I won't say names, but they traveled, their suitcases were stolen before they ever got off the plane. And then the person who stole them took the number, the phone number, and started calling them and harassing them and saying nasty things and horrible things to them. Now, it's not just being a thief, it's being a mean thief. 
uh, a person who wants to torment somebody. That's what this is talking about. The works that diligently work in the hearts of those that are disobedient to the truth of God who become darker and darker and darker and darker in their thinking and in their, in their ability to hurt people. That's just hurtful to steal somebody's stuff and then to turn around and try to call them and irritate them and then the police have to try to get it all, you know? So, disobedience God, the corruption that was in, in us from birth was expressed through the disease and the desires of our self-life. We live by whatever natural cravings and thought our mind dictated and we live as rebellious children subject to God's wrath because of our separation from God just like the whole world. That's what the world's condition is. What a sad condition because Christ offers it to everybody. He says we lived by that and then, verse 4, but by. <laughs> that that's the condition of things and that's the way things are. But God says that's, that's my children. Those are my babies. Those are my kids. Okay? So God still loves us with his great love. He is so rich in compassion and mercy. What did you all come up with on your lesson for what mercy is? Because you had a question. What is mercy? What did you all come up with in mercy? Forgiveness even though we don't deserve it. Yes. Not punishing someone when they deserve it. Mm -hmm. And grace? Grace is a blessing, unmerited favor, mm -hmm. giving a gift that's not earned. Mm -hmm. So the two go together. So you have grace, which is getting what you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. And the two of them work hand in hand, mercy and grace. That is the picture of the holy of holies, the mercy seat. The mercy seat is the representation of Christ. Christ's death. Now, this is important because this is really where everything hangs, ladies. Christ's death on the cross. Christ became, and people don't understand this, but Christ became sin for us. What does that mean? That means that every sin that Barbara West would do from the time that she understood as a little one that she was being selfish <laughs> and taking something that wasn't hers, all the way to every single mistake I've ever made in my life or will make or could have made or might have made, Jesus became Barbara West on that cross. And he died literally so that I no longer have sin. I no longer have it. He took it. All my sin that I will ever do for the rest of my life was placed on Christ. Therefore, there is no more sin in me. There's none. There is no more sin in me. I am perfect. That's what Ephesians is all about. Your position now is you are made perfect in Christ. Oh, it's going to go even a little bit further here in the next verse. It's going to say you were raised with him. Oh, let's go on. Let's look at it because I'm telling you, this is exciting when we think about it. So, it says... God loved us with his compassion, his love, his mercy, that even though we were dead and doomed in our sins, from before the foundations of the world, he knew who you would be. That you would be born in sin because the consequences of sin is death to the flesh, okay? The flesh is, is corruptible and it will die. There's no way to make no matter what you do, there's no way to make your, your flesh incorruptible. You can. Nothing I can do to do that. It is who I am. I am 
corruptible flesh. So Jesus Christ comes, and because he takes my corruptible flesh, and he becomes my corruptible flesh on the cross, that, because I have accepted what he did on the cross for me, that incorruptibleness has been now given to me, that now I am incorruptible. There is no more sin in me. Now, wait a minute. But you still sin. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. I have a choice every day to walk in who I am or to walk in who I was. Because I was that. And the part of my mind that hangs on to that person that I was, that part of my mind that hangs on to that person, wants to act that person out in the flesh. The flesh is nothing more than a form. This is just a body. It's, it's just a form. Jesus came in a form like me. A form that was dying. Christ also was born into corruptible flesh. And because he was born into corruptible flesh, he was tempted with everything that I'm tempted with. He experienced the same I experienced, but he chose to live in reverence to God. And so he went to the cross pure with no sin, but then he became my sin on the cross, literally became Barbara West's sin. He became Hitler. He became Mussolini. He became every person's sin that ever lived or ever will live. He became Adam's sin on the cross. And because he became that sin on the cross, when he died and was buried, when God raised him from the dead, look what this next verse says. It says, even though when we were dead and doomed by our sins, we were united to Christ, saved by his wonderful grace, he raised us up. When he raised, even though I was never born, I wasn't even born yet, but I was already in the imagination and heart of God. And so this is God's word to Barbara West. Barbara West died on the cross. Now this is the word of what happens with Barbara West now that Barbara West has died on that cross. Here we go. He raised Barbara West up with Christ, the exalted one, and with Christ, she ascended with him into glorious perfection and authority of the heavenly realms. Now listen. And she, Barbara West, is now co-seated as one with Christ in the heavens. Ha! That's pretty strong stuff, isn't it? Because Christ died and became Barbara West. Now this is before Barbara West was even born. He was put into the tomb. The stone rolled. Barbara West was dead with him. Then God raised him from the dead. And God raised with him from the dead Barbara West. Are you getting this? And then when he ascended, 40 days later, he ascended into the heavens and sat by the Father. And Barbara West was co-seated with him in the heavenlies, in perfection and authority to reign as a co-heir with him when he comes back. My seat is already sitting there with my name on it. Now, it's, that's exciting. Now look at the next one. Throughout all the coming ages, and that actually means future earth, future earth, universes, everything that God will recreate, the new heavens, the new earth. She, speaking of Barbara West again, will be the visible display throughout all the rest of eternity when God creates the new heavens and the new earth. Barbara West will be a visible display to everything created of the infinite, limitless riches of the grace, God's grace, and kindness, which was lavished upon her through Christ Jesus. 
I mean, really, ladies. That's what we have. That's what you got. For it was only through this wonderful grace that we were able to believe in him. Grace isn't even something we abscond. It's given to us. It's given to us. Nothing we could do to er ever earn this salvation just believed in him for it was the gracious gift from God that brought us to Christ. God is the one who pushed us towards Christ and said, this is your gift. This is what I'm giving you. This will complete you and fill you and make life good. And God himself through the Holy Spirit who moves us, pushes us towards God. Now how does that happen? Well, God's word throughout the Psalms and other things is God makes himself displayed to everybody. There's no one without excuse. You can't ignore God. You'll be miserable if you do. And people that do are miserable. That's the person who stole the suitcase and is calling harassing. A miserable, miserable person. This is what God does to that person. He doesn't hate that person. He hates the sin. But he's pushing that person towards God. And everything that they're miserable with, that misery is to push them towards God. When they recognize it, they get miserable enough. They'll either die in their misery or they'll wake up to their need. Each one of us have a crisis of belief where we come to a place with God that we say, I want you or I don't. If you don't, he's not forcing himself on you. If you do, this is what he does. You say, I want you. He lavishly fills us with Jesus Christ. He gives us our spirit back in life. We breathe in life. Our spirit begins to communicate and connect with the Father. It, is, it begins to understand the relationship with the beloved, which is Christ Jesus, our husband. And then we begin to understand the Shekinah glory of the Holy Spirit that indwells us. And we began to understand our part in the Godhead. That he created us not to just be a little minion down here on the earth to get his work done. He created us to be a part of himself. Of who he is, what he's doing, how he's doing it. For all of eternity. And you are the center of why he's doing it. Because of his lavish love for you. For humanity. For this earth, for people, for all of us. And he says to us throughout it, through all of it, that this is not just important for you, this is important for God. This is something that's vitally, seriously on his heart. He's had Barbara Wicks on his heart since before he created the world. Therefore, he is actively involved in every single second my life to see that my path is pushing me constantly towards my destiny. Look what it says. We have become, we'll go back, nothing we did can earn salvation for its gracious gift from God and brought to us from Christ. So no one will ever be able to boast. For salvation is never a reward for doing well or good works or human striving. But we now listen, lady. It says, we are his poetry. Poetry is like music. Poetry is the language of, literally, of, of the heart. Of the heart. And your heart, which is that part of us that is spirit, is only alive in Christ. Christ is the only one who could really be the poet because he's the only one who understands the big picture of why everything works the way it was, why we work the way we work. So he has said to me, Barbara West is my poem. <laughs> I am his poetry. And when I am out in the world, I am to be his poetry, his lyrics, his music, his soothing, his, 
his flowing out into people of what God is creating us to be. We are his pro pro poetry, a recreated people, folk, folk, recreated people, fulfill that will that will fulfill their destiny that he has given to each one of them. He's given you as a gift your destiny. Now remember last week we read that our destiny, our destiny, last week we studied, was established before the foundation of the world. So your destiny was established before you were born. And you think, well, wait a minute, I have free will. Yes, you do. This is the beauty of it. Because when you have a child, your child, you have in your heart and your mind a plan for them to succeed in life. You want to see them succeed in school. You want to see them succeed with their friends. You want to see them succeed in, in their teenage years and then make healthy relationships, have good friends. You, I mean, before they're ever born, we thought, what will their career be? What will they do? We can't plan that out for our children, but we have hopes for them, don't we, and dreams. And so, of course, we get angst when they're not fitting in with our dream and our thought for them. Our angst is they're not doing it the way that I thought they would do it. <laughs> And the fact is, is that no one ever does. No one ever does. But God has a destiny. Now, this destiny that he has created for you is a destiny for you to have the very best, most joyous, productive, perfect life that you would have. But God knows if you have that, then you won't grow. And so... He, in his own wisdom, has placed in your destiny things that change you, teach you, transform you, work on you, make you become more in his image. Some of those things are not comfortable. Some of them are right down painful. But they have purpose. And every single thing has purpose. And so God, from the beginning, has a purpose and a destiny in our life. And he is diligent about allowing us to make choices, and yet he continues to guide and work to bring them all for his good, to fit into his plan for our ultimate destiny. So he has, he has made it so that you, and it's not a choice, because once you give your life to him, you will fulfill your destiny. So you will fulfill your destiny. He has given each of us, for we are joined to Jesus, the anointed one. And even before we were born, God planned in advance our destiny for good works that we would do to fulfill it. That we he planned. This is really good because we get so hung up on good works. Good works, good works, good works. If you don't have works, then your faith is dead. True, James said so. You know, without works, faith is dead. But here's the deal. God's already in this whole destiny placed in there the good works that you would do. Do you realize that sometimes you are doing good works and you don't even realize you're doing it? Because when you become his, he is so instrumental in what I have always called God nods or God moments or synchronicity of how God literally puts things together, like Sandy not going to Israel. Now we look at that as kidding and joking and she didn't have to fall and you know, mess up a table. But that, and giggling at it. But the fact is, is that God knew before Sandy was born that she would not be going to Israel. He knew before she was born that she would have cancer. He was in her when that first cancer cell developed and began to spread. He knew. He has the power to go, my child doesn't need that. And I even believe that there are many times in our lives that things do go awry. And he's got that little DNA in there going, <laughs> fixing things. We don't have a clue what he's doing in us. And every single thing that comes to us 
comes with purpose to fulfill the destiny that he, before we were born, took the trouble and the love and the grace and the mercy to work out for our success. Every time you breathe in, we talked about that last week, you are saying his name, Yahweh. That, and I'll say it again because if you didn't hear it last week, but when you breathe in, the word Yah is not pronounceable, it is actually a sound, a gasp. Yahweh. It is the breath. That's the Hebrew. It has always been that way. They couldn't even write it because it wasn't a verbal word. It was a breath. And God is even the breath within the breath. Because the breath within the breath is the breath to our spirit. And he is constantly working in us to change us he is with us every moment. Now here's what, here's the deal. Okay, I'm perfect. I just love it. I tell Lily that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I am perfection in God's sight. But I constantly, because there is always going to be in me the challenge of darkness, because that is part of my progression and my trip in my destiny. And what God teaches us over the, over the course of our lives is that when we are suffering, when we are suffering, and we talked about suffering last week, that we need to stop and examine the moment. And what I mean by that is a lot of our suffering comes because we live, it's, it's related to time. You think about your suffering. Your suffering very often is in two areas. One is the past. And we dwell and make storylines in the past all the time. My past, no matter how many people I walked through with it, is 100% only my past. Nobody else has it. And my past isn't even reality because I've changed it so much by my own perspectives and my own thoughts and even my own darkness and my own and the light that God has given me that I've doctored that up so much that 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 is supposed to literally have identified who I am in the flesh is a convoluted mess. <laughs> that when I sit in it, worry about it, regret it, regurgitate it. I am living in the old identity of the flesh, and the flesh suffers. When you are suffering, you are in the flesh most of the time. There is a suffering in the spirit, but it's different. And so when you're suffering and you're, and you're in pain, very often it's because you are trying to be in control. You're trying to fix it. You're worried about it. Example, your kids. They're, they're, they're adults now, they're out living their adult lives and they are making a mess and then and you want to fix it. And as soon as you step over here and you begin to puppet master, you're suffering. Because you can't fix it. Only God is fixing it because their story and their, their timeline and their destiny is not yours. And what's going to fix them to meet their ultimate goal with Christ is 180 degrees different than your experience because they're individual. And so if I'm over there involved in theirs, then I'm no longer concentrating on what my destiny progression is. Same thing with living over here in the future. My future is in, and my hope is in Jesus Christ. But if I start planning anything else out here in the future that becomes my focus, and I, it takes me out of the present, then this is also distraction, and can also become something that leads me into trying to be in control of myself. 
Anytime you're in control yourself, you are trying to be God. I mean, it's that simple. I'm sorry, ladies. It is tough, but it's true. I've had to tell myself the same thing. Anytime I try to be in control, I am trying to be God. So what is the answer? To live in the present. To live in the moment. That's where God's presence is. That's where he is. Even when you're, somebody's talking to you and teaching you, even when you're watching TV, even if you're reading a book, listening to music, just try, just try for, for one, uh, one little section. Take 10 minutes and try to clear your mind of everything and only think about God's love. Hard to do. Because our mind wants to go <laughs> But God's God's presence is here, right here, right now. And what does that mean? That means that we, that's when we see the God in us. That's when, when we're going through the path, when we're in the present, and we're following God, walking with Jesus step by step. Living in the present is when we start being able to understand how to respond like Christ. Because there's nothing, look around you. There's nothing urgent going on right now. So what I'm going to ask you to do, and we're going to go back to that first verse about the fullness. And a few, a couple years ago when I first came into the women's group, uh, Miss Louise and I think Cynthia was a part of our group at the time, we were at a leadership meeting and we were talking about contemplative prayer or meditative prayer. Prayer where you aren't petitioning, but prayer where you're sitting quietly. Quietly, just waiting. No agenda. No, no plan. No, no questions. Just sitting, quiet. And we tried to do it for five minutes, don't we, Melinda? I don't remember that. You don't remember this? We were at your house. We tried to do it for five minutes. Everybody sit down for five minutes. We were talking about the prayer walk. Remember when we were talking about the prayer walk? And how that they went, and we were talking about all that. I don't know, it made a big impression yeah. on me. But um, we tried it for five minutes. And all I could do was bounce around and listen to the clock ticking and go, how much more time do we have? <laughs> you know, I couldn't, I couldn't get my mind to be quiet. There was just, I had never tried that before. I had never practiced it. And, and everybody was, I was kind of like stepping back going, oh, no, I don't, I think that's kind of like stepping over into meditation a little bit. That, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't get it. And Miss Louise, sweet as she is, she said, I do this every day. She said, I do this every day. And I was like, it shows. It shows. And I made it a journey to say, I want to do this. I want to. Well, I'm going to be honest with you ladies, five minutes is hard. Now I'm up to two hours. Right? I am. Because it's changed my life. It has. And I'm going to tell you a little bit, of, just a short little thing, but this, this whole thing on the fullness of God, if you can get to a point where you can put yourself, Miss Louise has a, a, a recliner she gets in. She gets in her recliner. She gets quiet with the Lord. And she says, Lord, what do you want to say to me today? This is exactly how she explained it to us. What do you want to say to me today? What is it that you have today for me to do? And then she's quiet. And so I started working on this. I said, well, you know, I can do, I can do five minutes. I will get to where I will do five minutes. And I mean, I, I have to challenge you that if you try to do it, Come and tell me how it works for you, because I think sometimes I'm just a little bit of attention deficit disorder, because it's hard for me to be still, anyways. The Lord really, before I ever read this about the fullness of God, that's what the Lord gave me in one of my quiet times. And 
what I have started doing is that I get quiet. I, I, when I'm ready to sit down, I have. I make sure there's no distractions, no phone, no TV, no talking to, to somebody. I'll even say to Billy, and most of the time I'll go outside. I'm going to go outside and sit for a while. I've bundled up in the winter. I've got a fire pit. I've got, I know y'all don't think I'm weird. I think that they have something else like this. But, <laughs> but you know, put on your little, I put on my little jacket, hand warmer, stuff down in my gloves, scarf, sitting out there with the fire pit, dark at night. All right, Lord, it's me and you. Where'd you want to go? And I'm telling you what, I felt like God's presence, but it took me a long time to get to the point, I mean, like weeks, to get to the point where I could be still and be quiet. But when the Lord began to teach me to be quiet, He began to talk to me. He began to explain scriptures to me. He began to fit scriptures together. He began to pull old things that my mama had said and taught years ago and began to put them all in place. He began to open the word that I would read it and all of a sudden I was like, I never saw that before. The fullness of God. I know, I know y'all remember in September, I kept saying, I gotta be still, I gotta be still, I gotta be still. Remember me telling you, I gotta be still, I gotta learn to be quiet, I gotta learn to be quiet. And the Lord has taught me to be still. And at first I was so afraid I would lose it because it felt fragile. It felt like if I even, if I even blink, my mind's gonna go, beep! And it does, and I'm not gonna lie to you, it does. But you learn to go bink and go draw it right back in and center. And I learned to center on my spirit and to get out of my mind. And as I did that, I began to recognize this is who I really am. This is ego. That's ego. That person that I was in the flesh. Everything is really, really about Barbara. Everything in life. How's it going to affect Barbara? What do you think of me? What do you think of what do I get to do? I'll pretend that I get you if you pretend you get me. Okay. You know, it's kind of like this whole, you're walking around in the world just trying to fit in. No home. Nowhere that you feel 100%. Always a little bit off. And then God. But... And that fullness that he fills us with can bring you to where, I'm telling you, my shoulders and my whole life have always been up here. And God is gone. Now I want you to do something. We're going to do it for five minutes. We've got a few minutes here. Maybe three, maybe two. But I want you just to be quiet for a minute. I want you to close your eyes. I want you to take a deep breath in. And just be still.
nothing but just quiet. Let him take you into green pastures and make you lay down. Because that quietness stills the pull of the world back into that flesh. That quiet.
be who you were created to be. You are awesome. And you are one of a kind. No one else like you. God made you to fit a need in his life that nobody else can fill. You fill him. That's who we are in Christ. His children. His offspring. His image. I am humbled. Humbled by that. Savior. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you did the work for us. You've done it all. You are all in all and indescribable. And Lord, just surrendering to you <coughs> is what it is to recognize you are God. Surrendering what we want, what we like.